Hi, I'm Robert Krulwich, and welcome to Nova Science Now, where we consider not one, but several science stories. Tonight, they're basically puzzles, beginning with a problem. So, just come on back, come on back, and... All right, stop. Good. The... <clears throat> Internal combustion engine, which fouls the air and uses gas, which comes from oil, which is getting expensive, involves the Middle East, gets us into all kinds of fights. Who <coughs> wouldn't want to replace this with a more efficient and affordable alternative? But is there an alternative? Because <coughs> there is this engine we keep hearing about, which is supposed to be fabulous. It's coming soon. <coughs> but the puzzle is, how soon? Every year, Detroit unveils, with much to do, a car of the future. And the hoopla here isn't about what this car does, it's about what this car doesn't do. This car doesn't use gasoline, none, because it is powered by a fuel cell. Fuel cells. Fuel cells. They're powered by a fuel cell. Fuel cells are the wave of the future. The wave of the future. Really? This is the future? Well, maybe we should take a closer look. So I decided to test drive a fuel cell car, and I invited a couple of friends to come along. What do we think? We don't know anything. Tom and Ray Maliazzi, the car talk guys from National Public Radio. What was that whistling noise? <laughs> yeah, what is that whistling? What's that about? That sounds like F above middle C. <laughs> I, just, I would like to open the hood just to see what's there. Don't shut it off. Oh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and don't lock the keys of it. I'll leave a window open. Dinah, see what's happening. What the heck is this? See? I knew it. It's not an engine. Well, it has a box, and it has lots of things connected Actually, to it. Actually, my intuition tells me this is an electric motor. Well, this is basically an electric motor. So you know what it sounds of... like? It sounds like my Nord's refrigerator. <laughs> Tom and Ray know a lot about regular cars, the ones with internal combustion engines. This, on the other hand, is an electric car, but you don't plug it in. Instead, it's powered by this mysterious fuel cell thing. Yeah, this is stuff, this is technology that none of us understands. No one told us this. Do we need help? We need help. You know, maybe we can we get this. someone to pass her by. I mean, just some ordinary citizen. Dan? <laughs> oh, my God. Thank goodness the car comes with its own expert, Dan Kelly, who works for a company that actually makes fuel cells. So it has an electric motor. What runs the motor? All the electricity comes from the fuel cell. And the fuel cell is really made up of a collection of these. This is a fuel cell? It, it looks like a black plastic license plate. This is one cell. And it's like a sandwich. You just stack them up. You want more power? Add more cells. Make a bigger sandwich. And what goes through, if you look at it... It's a piece of plastic. And the grooves that are in it... <laughs> yeah, what is this? You get hydrogen runs through these grooves. So what's really going on inside these little holes? How is this thing making electricity? Well, inside the fuel cell, there are two sets of tiny passageways separated by a membrane. And if you look very close, the two main sections are kind of like the two sides of a tennis court. On one side is hydrogen, and on the other side, oxygen. And then there's the membrane that separates them. It's kind of like a net. So here we are in a tennis court. I, of course, you notice now, represent the atom oxygen. And for those of you who are oxygen atoms yourselves, you'll, of course, recognize that I have eight electrons. This is a fuel cell, so oxygen is opposite hydrogen. There are two hydrogen atoms, and if you rotate, please, you will see that they, too, each have one <laughs> electron. <laughs> now, it is in the nature of this kind of chemistry that hydrogen and oxygen are attracted to each oh, other. I yearn for you, Robert. You yearn for me, but there is a membrane between us. Now, the rules of the fuel cell are you will try to come to me, try to come to me, but you'll have to go under or through the membrane. Let's try under the membrane. Try under. Okay. So down they go, the two hydrogen <laughs> atoms approaching the oxygen atom with ardor. But we notice now... Robert, I love you. <laughs> yes. Through we the membrane... It, we made it! Oh, my God! Now, but... Fine. Before, and I use the word but advisedly. <laughs> could you please rotate so show the audience your butts at this moment? What? You'll notice that what? this has got no electron, no electron here. The oh. question has to be asked, where are the electrons? Remember when the hydrogen had to come through the membrane? Well, when it did that, its electrons were stripped off. The electrons simply aren't allowed through the membrane in a fuel cell. But they do want to come to the other side, so very cleverly they go around the membrane. 
right at the edge of the fuel cell over and over and over again. And moving electrons, well, that's electrical current. That's what lights up a light bulb, or in this case, what powers your car. And here's what makes the fuel cells so clean. After the electrons get to the other side, they rejoin their old friends, hook up with the oxygen, and before you know it, you've got H2O, water. Pretty neat. So, in these cars, when you check the tailpipe, instead of exhaust, what you get is water. Oh, how do you know? Because it looks like water. Take a drink. Look it, look it, he's dead. <laughs> I didn't like him anyway. The very idea that a car's motor could be this clean has an enormous appeal, especially to certain politicians. They act like it's going to be easy. Well, sometimes they do. But as it turns out, there's a catch. Actually, a bunch of catches. Fuel cells are still very expensive to make. They wear out more quickly. You know, yeah, there's one other thing. A fuel cell needs fuel. So we've been talking about hydrogen and oxygen as our fuel. There's lots of oxygen, but where are we going to get the hydrogen in the first place? MIT chemistry professor Dan Nocera says, remember, you've got to have pure hydrogen all by itself on one side of the membrane to get things going. So where do you get pure hydrogen? Well, there's plenty of hydrogen on Earth. It's just not pure. It's stuck to other stuff, like oxygen, in water, of course. And hydrogen can be found in fuels like natural gas, you know, hydrocarbons. But if you take it out of there, and that's where most hydrogen comes from today, you do get a waste product, carbon dioxide. And that's one of the bad guys in global warming. So what's the answer? I think water is the key for the future. Every high school chemistry student knows how to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You just run electricity through it, that's electrolysis. But hydrogen and oxygen are so cozy and comfortable together, you use up so much electricity prying them apart, it could cost a fortune. So we are facing a significant technical problem here. How do we find a cheap, clean source of hydrogen? Oh, and there is another issue. <laughs> Excuse we'll us for a minute. Right back. Yeah. Don't we worry a little bit about the danger problem? What about the Hindenburg? Yeah, what about the, the huge balloon, the German? Yeah, the all the humanity, the whole thing. Yeah. We gotta ask. Yeah, yes. come on. Dan. <laughs> what about the Hindenburg? What about the Remember Hindenburg? The Hindenburg. <laughs> <laughs> The Hindenburg pretty much ruined hydrogen's reputation. But after the explosion, the fire here, the continuous flames that you see, some say they came from the canvas blimp, which was coated with highly flammable shellac. Are you comfortable getting back in now? Not really, no, I'll be walking back. <laughs> of course, gasoline is flammable too, and we drive around with gallons of that in our cars. It's something else about hydrogen. Well, hydrogen's a gas. Okay. That so, means most of the space between the hydrogen molecules is not useful to make energy. There's nothing there. So, says Nate Lewis, a scientist at Caltech, getting enough hydrogen into a car is a challenge because it likes to spread out and you've got to squeeze a lot of it into a small space. You can't use an ordinary gas tank to hold it because it would burst open and you wouldn't want that. <laughs> Did I run stop that? No. 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 So the hydrogen tanks have to be super strong to hold hydrogen squeezed in at pressures up to 5 to 10,000 pounds per square inch. But even with that special tank, it's tough to get enough hydrogen in the car. For instance, to drive 300 miles, you might need a gas tank four times the size of the one you've got now. Which leads Professor Lewis to suggest the best place for hydrogen fuel might be in power stations to light up cities and factories. After all, why rush to put this fuel out on the road when you can easily store plenty of it in a factory basement? So you're a put it in the basement guy. Put it in the basement first. And then if we ever figure out how to use it to move us around, that would be great. But your car is the last place that you want to put hydrogen. But the dream of a car that spews out nothing but water is so appealing. And if we could use water to fuel the car, that would be even better.
when the technology is really there, you'll be able to open that little gas fill and fill it up with water. Like my brother used to do when he was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the car will run. But the technology to get hydrogen from water efficiently and affordably, that technology doesn't exist yet. Well, is there anything that we know of that does this regularly, that breaks apart water and we do? It's the leaf. The, the what? Leaf. The leaf? It turns out the leaf is a pro at splitting water. In photosynthesis, leaves take water and break it down. The oxygen goes into the air, thank goodness, because that's what we breathe. And the hydrogen hooks up with carbon to make carbohydrates, which the plant needs for fuel. And the energy to do all this comes from the sun. So does Dan Nocera want to make like a leaf? And so what we've been doing is trying to actually not duplicate what a leaf does, but we're saying, can we generate hydrogen and oxygen by entirely new ways? In his lab, lasers stand in for the sun. What we do is we bring this laser beam in, and now you see actually here's a compound that's capturing that green light. So this is your version of sunshine, and this is your version of something that sunshine is acting on. The laser shoots through a liquid mixture concocted in Nocera's lab. He's trying to design a chemical, something like this pink peapod thing that does a special trick. So when light hits it, it will pull apart the H from the O. Have you ever taken a droplet of water and found a way to just release hydrogen? We haven't done water, but we've done hydrochloric acid and we've been able to make hydrogen. So you once got So that's a no. But there are labs all over the country now working on hydrogen. Some work with algae, some with solar collectors, and these guys are making hydrogen from water and sunlight, but at least for now, it's very expensive. And just last year, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Research Council reported there are major hurdles on the path to a hydrogen economy, and that clearing them will not be simple. So, even though the president is saying we could have hydrogen cars for today's generation, the first car driven by a child born today could be powered by hydrogen and pollution free. If the car is really going to be pollution free, the hydrogen in the tank will have to come from a clean source. And so far, when it comes to splitting water, we're way behind the leaf. Dan and other scientists are trying to catch up and will keep trying. But the secret, he thinks, may be very subtle. So how long did it take for the leaf to figure out how to separate hydrogen from oxygen? That took between two and four billion years. But how much time do you have? I'm guessing around 20 more years. And so whatever the politicians may say, learning to make like a leaf could take a while.